Fora TV. The world is thinking. First of all, I'd like to introduce the rector of the RCA, Sir Christopher Freeling, who's going to say a few words. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah, very good. I don't have to put on my Radio 4 voice. Welcome. Welcome back to some of you to the second year of uh, the Battle of Ideas at the Royal College, which was launched last year, as you say, 2005, by the Institute of Ideas, with the strapline, taking ideas seriously means they must be questioned, argued over, and fought, fought for, going beyond what works, what will play well, and what will sound good, which is what most ideas sound like these days. Um, and as the conference leaflet, leaflet adds, this is a working college, not a traditional conference. It's not too smooth, it's not too corporate. It's the sort of place where we, we work at ideas, which tend to be embodied in artifacts in, in this place, but uh, uh, for the next two days in discussion. And we hope it suits the kind of work in progress atmosphere of the next two days. And whenever anyone mentions the, the concept of ideas with reference to the college, I'm always reminded of an incident that occurred here uh, in the 1970s where a famous philosopher came to give a series of four lectures to our painting students on the subject of the history of ideas. And there were 20 students, which was the full complement. At his first lecture, they all turned up, and he gave this very, very dense lecture with lots of footnotes, as it were, and uh, quotes in different languages. No pictures, which is fatal in my world. And uh, anyway, at his second lecture of four, there were five students. At his third lecture, there were two students. And at his final lecture, there was one solitary student. And uh, so the philosopher turned to the student and said, there's not much point in going on, is there? Why don't we just have a cup of tea and talk about it? Uh, to which the student replied, I do wish you would go on. I've been trying to draw you for four weeks. <laughs> the, um, so I'm afraid that's the sort of place the Royal College is. And um, uh, the solitary student is reputed to have been David Hockney. I don't know if that's true. Um, uh, and it was Hockney who graduated, indeed, exhibited in this very gallery in, in 1962. And he very wisely said of art education, and I think this relates to the weekend's activities, that the cardinal sin for any teacher in the painting studios is not to have a point of view. Uh, the student may well disagree with the teacher's point of view, may well disagree with it very strongly, but what mustn't happen is for the teacher to be like a sponge uh, agreeing with everything that the student says. <coughs> And that goes very deep in art education, because out of the collision between teacher and student, said David, comes the discovery of one's own voice, a little bit like the artistic version of, of, of the dialectic. The key to that transaction is that both participants respect each other and respect the integrity of each other's ideas, even if they disagree very profoundly with them. And I think that's a very important thought about all kinds of education, that uh, if you press and it's like sponge, you don't define yourself against anything. So in the 1960s, in reaction against the old-style royal academicians who dominated the art scene in those days, what you get is the generation of David Hockney and R.B. Kittai and Derek Boscher, all taught by Peter Blake, exhibiting in this space in 1962, next door to Zandra Rhodes and Ossie Clark in textiles and fashion, uh, next door to Ridley Scott, uh, who graduated in graphic design in 1962 from here, and Margaret Calvert, and you say, who? Now, Margaret Calvert it was who went on to redesign all the road signs for the entire road system of the UK. So every time you're driving along the motorway and you see those signs, you take them for granted, but they actually revolutionised European road, road, safety, uh, road, road uh, direction design, uh, uh, a, a point about design being part of everyday life. And that was in the early 60s. If you dissolve for 30 years until the 1990s in this very room, uh, what you get is Tracy Emin, graduating, the Chapman Brothers, that was a famous uh, um, uh, uh, exhibition, and Chris O'Feely, um, and equally challenging people in all the disciplines of art and design, including a group of graphic designers who called themselves, I thought it was wonderful, they called themselves Why Not? And I think that sort of sums it all up, really. Uh, not to say why all the time, but why not? Um, one of the themes of this conference is the tension between innovation and bureaucracy. Another is how innovation can be used in socially useful and inclusive ways. And another is how to shed inhibitions in our thinking in an innovative way. And I like to think that this, we live those things, actually, every day here. On the subject of which, have you noticed, I only noticed this last week, really, how the language of the avant-garde in the arts has filtered into the world of business? Uh, it's extraordinary that all those phrases, fitness for purpose, that comes from the Bauhaus in the 1920s, 
Blue Skies Thinking, that's sort of Icarus, um, out of the box, uh, was actually first used about the Salon des Refusés in France in the late 19th century. Um, challenging orthodoxies, constant reflection on one's own practice, cutting edge, which of course comes from craftsmanship. And this whole language of the artistic avant-garde in design has been sort of hijacked by business vocabulary. Uh, and whereas reports written 10 years ago would have used a completely different discourse, now uh, one has to present oneself as in a permanent state of avant-garde. Um, the... Um, I remember going to an exhibition of uh, contemporary design uh, at the V&A about 10 years ago, and someone said, it's all very well to be so avant-garde, but where can I find someone who can design a fire guard? Actually, that'd be rather nice, but anyway. The, um, uh, uh, so that's, you know, just a thought. We believe the battle of ideas, therefore, is happening in just the right place, uh, in a creative hothouse, an ideas factory, where, as I say, we tend to, to trade in artefacts rather than words, that student who drew, um, but you'll be trading in words. I can remember just another kind of RCA joke, uh, giving a lecture uh, to the fashion students in the early 70s on the book Mythologies by Roland Barthes. You remember that collection of essays all about uh, different aspects of popular culture? And I was giving my all on Mythologies, which had recently been translated. And after the lecture, no questions. And a couple of days later, the librarian phoned me up and said one of, one of the students had gone into the library and asked for a book called The Mythologies of Roman Baths. <laughs> which sounds a great deal more interesting than the book that I was talking about, actually, but I think that shows that lecturing isn't always the most efficient way of putting over <laughs> bibliographical information. Of course, the word idea can be defined in all sorts of different ways. Uh, something, a thought in the mind, an opinion, a conviction, a plan or scheme or design, uh, the significance of a particular situation, the heart of it, an effortful activity, which I believe it to be, or simply a notion or fancy, which is what an 18th century person would have meant very often by the word idea. I don't expect there'll be much room for notions or fancies over the next couple of days as you work over various themes and topics with your debates and critical thinking and discussion. And with the 150 invited speakers and polemicists and activists who'll be talking to you. And as the brochure says, the themes and topics relate to education, health, the arts, the sciences, the media, the environment, religion, and even happiness. A word which, against all the odds, has been hijacked by politicians in the last three months. The happiness agenda. We've had the respect agenda, we now have the happiness agenda. Um, the sound of clashing discourses will no doubt resonate across the two days. Even the word discourse, of course, is a word to start an <coughs> argument with. I did an article for the magazine um, Modern Painters, edited by Peter Fuller in the 1970s. And I'd just been reading Foucault, like everyone else, and the word discourse was every other line of my review. You know, the discourse of art, the discourse of that. And while he was sub-editing it, he crossed out the word discourse and put in the word chat. <laughs> and the review was quite astonishing. Chat about art, chat... And it really, I haven't used the word since. Uh, <laughs> So discourse is pretty controversial. Um, many questions have already been posed by the organisers even before battle is joined. Looking through your brochure, I was struck, of course, by the breadth as well as the timeliness of your agenda. What's the proper value of the arts in a democratic society? Are leaps in nanotechnology and biotechnology changing what it means to be human? Is innovation characterised by caution and modesty or this avant-garde thing? Indeed, uh, many different arenas to choose from. Battle for affluence, battle over nature, battle for the law, battle for the media, and last but not least, the battle for innovation. And you have all these rather, rather uh, nice phrases, cafe conversations, breakfast banters, salon debates, thoughts for the day, which presumably means something different to the Radio 4 version, <laughs> provocation lectures, a range of lunch hour events, screenings and exhibitions. Anyway, in conclusion, H.G. Wells famously said that human history is in essence the history of ideas whatever it may look like at the time. But even at his most visionary, in his science fiction moments, he couldn't have predicted that quite so many ideas were going to be whizzing around in such a concentrated space over the next two days. Who knows, uh, some of them might even make history. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope it goes well. Enjoy yourselves. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I also just want to say thank you to the rest of the uh, uh, RCA team who've uh, been working very hard with us over the last couple of months and who've made us feel uh, very welcome here. Uh, I now want to introduce George Brock. George is the Saturday editor of The Times, a paper with, um, I think, a very solid reputation in taking ideas and arguments and debates uh, seriously. 
and I'm delighted that George and the Times have come on board with us again this year uh, as our uh, uh, headline partner, one of our headline partners for the Battle of Ideas. So if I could ask George to give us some wisdom for a couple of minutes. Thank you, James. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really here possibly to give you some wisdom, but more importantly, from my point of view, to celebrate something. There's been quite a lot of comment and debates recently about how much hunger and appetite there is for public debate. New debating forums are popping up like mushrooms all over the place in the free market of ideas. Demand has created some supply. And lots of people have been saying recently, quite rightly, that pitched battles of real ideas do actually turn out to be or are not really under great threat from that great Socrates, say, Jonathan Ross. I learnt this lesson about the hunger and appetite for debate exactly a year ago, standing on more or less exactly this spot. That was the opening of the first Battle of Ideas conference a year ago, and I was present at the opening session, and I turned up at the Royal College of Art at 10 in the morning on what was a dank, cold October Saturday morning. I thought, well, the Battle of Ideas guys, they're very conscientious, they cater to minority tastes, I'm going to be talking to a couple of dozen people tops. As right now, there were at least a couple of hundred people in the room, and I learned an important lesson about how many people like live debate and how well it needs to be done. While we celebrate this trend, we needn't pretend, however, that all the debates are of the same quality, because they aren't. The Times is excited and proud to be backing the Battle of Ideas because this is the best intellectual boxing ring in town. You get a very nice class of egghead pugilism here. <laughs> you get prize fights of world standard. I could mix my metaphors even further, and in fact I will. Speakers are encouraged not only to get out of the box, but to climb right out of it and cross the frontier next door. Audiences are invited to upstage the speakers, which they do very successfully very often. You can hear and join debates ranging from superhumans to sustainability to the survival of the book and dozens of others. Back before the beginning of recorded time, when I was taking university exams, a friend of mine wrote me a good luck card. And on the card he wrote, teachers often warn you on the eve of exams to answer the question but it is at least as important to question the answer. And I often think of that card when I'm thinking of the Institute of Ideas. I don't think any orthodoxy or common wisdom is entirely safe in these buildings for the next two days. So have fun, keep reading the Times, and above all, above all, remember what they say in Texas, sacred cows make the best burgers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, George. I don't want this to get too like the Oscars where I say thanks to everyone from uh, Claire Fox and my mum and dad, but I, I do just want to say a couple of other thanks. Along with the Times and the RCA, um, we, we're very generously uh, being supported by Pfizer and Research Councils UK. Uh, so a big thank you to them for backing us on this uh, project. And then there's a host of other bodies and institutions who have been uh, very supportive, and you'll meet them and find out a bit, about, a bit about them throughout the day as they're backing different themes and strands. So thanks to everyone who's put a lot of effort into uh, pulling this event off. Um, I think, as you've already heard, throughout the course of this weekend, uh, around 150, 160 speakers will be taking part in almost 50 debates, salons and sessions. We've got individuals from the worlds of media, uh, we've got egghead pugil pugilists, we've got academics, we've got people from education, we've got people from sports, we've got opiners from all different directions. And they're all experts in their field, they've all got something we think important and interesting to say. However, unlike other conferences and book festivals uh, where the audience comes along to listen to a lecture from uh, experts at the front, uh, we've given them each about five minutes uh, 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 to explain their theory of the world before we hand over uh, to the audience. And I hope none of them will be in any way offended by that. It's not a disservice to the ideas or the arguments that they have, but on the contrary, it's based on the idea that uh, we at the Institute of Ideas, and I hope all of you, uh, believe that debate and argument is so important uh, that we want to give everyone in this room a chance to actually get involved in the debate, to get involved in the argument, 
Uh, uh, so the panellists are really here to kick off a discussion uh, that everyone else can then get involved in and battle away. And I think, as, as, as George has already uh, uh, suggested, uh, this weekend's called the Battle of Ideas very consciously because we think that ideas are worth battling over. And there are certainly, there is, as we've discovered with this event, as people discover with, with other conferences and at public forum, there really is a thirst for debate and argument at the moment. But at the same time, in the uh, kind of institutions where we might expect that to be going on, debate and argument seems uh, uh, somewhat unpopular. So in the political world, uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of substance, doesn't seem to be an awful lot of uh, confrontation between uh, opposing ideas and opposing uh, parties. And when debate is raised, uh, if you think, for example, of, of Jack Straw raising a debate about the veil, the default position that, that very quickly seems to emerge uh, is that uh, such a discussion may be important, but it has to be had within uh, certain lines. It has to be had uh, uh, in a way that uh, isn't going to run the risk of offending uh, too many people. And those of us who work in the academy in, in universities, uh, and I guess there's quite a number of us here today, uh, along with being tasked with providing an education for students, we're now also being tasked uh, with uh, uh, spying on our students, to all intents and purposes, with uh, 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 watching them carefully and, and raising the alarm if any of them seem to be uh, engaging in, in, in what, some kind of radical activity. Now, I, the point of these examples is simply to say whatever you think about the discussion, whatever you think about which side is right or wrong, whether it's about the veil or uh, uh, the radicalization, whether it's about uh, 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 the war in Iraq or a host of other themes and issues that uh, are, are going to be the focus of, of this weekend's discussions, whatever you think about them, they're not issues that we can let slip by without subjecting them to some very serious and rigorous argument and discussion. And that's really uh, uh, why we established the Battle of Ideas last year and why we're here again this year. Uh, as an attempt to establish a space where we can actually hold ideas and hold each other uh, to account and work out perhaps uh, uh, a bit more clearly what we ought to think and what we ought to be doing. We're not going to reach very many conclusions today. I uh, will be surprised if we reach any conclusions today or tomorrow. Um, but that's not necessarily the point. This is a chance to come together for a weekend, uh, just one weekend in the year, but the battle of ideas also runs on uh, throughout the year. A number of people have been involved in debates and salons that we've had in the run-up to this event. And you'll discover throughout the course of the weekend that a, a, a lot of the strands are being organized and produced by different uh, Institute of Ideas forums. So if your appetite is whetted uh, for debate and you want to get more involved in the discussion, then please do talk to some of the people who organize the forums and get involved in debate in that way. We'll also have, we also have other debates and sessions throughout the year. We have battles in print. So the idea of the Battle of Ideas is that this is a weekend, but really this is a chance to kick off some debates that we want to take seriously enough to keep uh, coming back to and returning to and working through as the year progresses. That's why I think uh, 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 the important slogan that we have for the Battle of Ideas is free speech allowed. Many people talk about free speech. We like to think that at the Battle of Ideas, uh, we can really have some free speech, that people can speak without fear of offence and without censor, and they can raise what they want, and we can all engage with that. So that's what I hope this weekend is going to be about. I now want to hand things over to session chairs and speakers and to all of you uh, who are going to be sat listening uh, and invite you, I guess, to let the battle commence. So thank you very much and enjoy the weekend. <laughs>